Hello, everyone. I am Corey Andrew Powell, and I am so excited to bring you another inspiring episode of Motivational Mondays. Today, we are honored to have a truly remarkable guest joining us. That's Dr. Kama Ennis, MD, MPH. We're going to ask her, like, what all those wonderful letters are after her name, of course. Now, Dr. Ennis is not only an accomplished physician, but also the visionary creator and founder of Faces of Medicine, which is a groundbreaking narrative health equity project focused on the journeys of Black female physicians. Dr. Ennis, welcome to Motivational Mondays. Thank you so much for having me. It is a pleasure to be here. Thank you. It's our pleasure as well. And um, so MD, we know means medical doctor, uh, I would imagine. Um, what are, what are, what is the MPH as for? Uh, what does that stand for? So the MPH stands, it's a master's degree in public health. A master's degree in public Okay. Yes. And so I earned that degree. Um, I actually, while I was in medical school, way back when in the 90s, mm. uh, it was to, to, from my perspective, it was getting very myopic, very narrow in focus appropriately focused on disease and illness, but I felt like we were missing the forest for the trees to some mm. extent. And I wanted to get a broader perspective and sort of remember the the context in which illness occurs, in which wellness flourishes. And so I went and uh, went to get a degree in public health between my third and fourth year of medical school. Wow, that's amazing. And I just want to say for me personally, anyone who enters the medical profession, uh, teaching, uh, that's another one for me that I think is just so admirable. And even law enforcement, I mean, you know, making those decisions, you know, the military, things that are really so um, giving of self. I am so, so uh, an admirer of people who do that. So first of all, thank you for choosing that profession because that really benefits society as a whole. So that's really important. So thank you for that. Well, thank you. It was, it, there was no choice for, I mean, it was, it wasn't that there wasn't a choice. It was that I think somewhere in second or third grade, I was like, oh, wait, if I go into medicine, if I become a doctor out of nowhere, it's not like there were doctors in my family. I had no mm. idea what I was getting into. My family was just like, okay, go, go do right. that. <laughs> right, I was like, right. if I'm a doctor, all I have to do is help. I don't have to think about whether it's a good person or a bad person, mm. whether what they're, what they've done in the rest of their lives. All I have to think about is that my job is to help them here and now. Mm -hmm. And so that made it simple for me in that way. And then I realized that the course to get there was a, was going to be a long one, but I was all in. We know it's interesting you bring that up because what you just said basically speaks to equity. I mean, it's the idea of helping someone in need without considerations of their skin, gender, ethnicity, all those things. And that becomes the foundation, obviously, for this wonderful project you're doing. So can you share the inspiration behind creating Faces of Medicine and what motivated you to start the, this health, this specific uh, narrative health equity project? So Faces of Medicine uh, is an idea that came to me a couple of years ago, and it was in the middle of a career transition for myself. I was I loved emergency medicine. I practiced it for nearly 20 years and also knew that it was time for me to make a move for lots of different reasons. But at the time I was one of only two black doctors at the hospital mm -hmm. and knowing the health equity impacts when there isn't diversity in healthcare teams, even though I love and trust the people at my hospital, I know that the presence of people who are underrepresented makes a difference for our patients, for mm -hmm. all patients. And it was really, it made it a, a struggle for me to to take care of myself and transition like I needed to. Um, and then what I realized was like, I, what I need to do is figure out a way to replace myself. And then as you peel back all of the layers of the onion, you know, black women are only 2.8% of physicians in this country. Hmm. The same is essentially true of black men. That's not enough. Like it's about a third of our representation in the population at large. And so trying to find people to replace myself, you can't hire people that don't exist. And yeah. so wow. wanting to figure out a way to increase that that pipeline, that funnel of people coming into medicine that represent broader communities. Mm. And so the idea of using storytelling as a vehicle is what really came to mind because you can Google anybody. Anybody can do a web search and figure out where somebody went to school, but knowing the journey, I think makes a big difference in terms of like being able to identify with somebody who looks like you, who struggled like you, who still felt like it was worth it to get to the other side and still wants to be on that other side and practice mm. medicine. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was, that was the core of it. You know, it reminds me of when I have had conversations on the show with um, black doctors who are in the mental health space. And they will say, they will tell me a lot about a very similar dynamic in which, you know, historically, I would say systemically people of color do not, or I would say had not really been so open to the idea of, um, of going to therapy. 
you know, to talk about their problems. I know my grandmother was like, I'm not telling no white, you know, I think she said, I'm not telling no white man my problems. <laughs> and, you know, she's like, oh, Virginia, oh, Southern black woman from Virginia. And mm -hmm. it seems so foreign to her. But now when you, you put the element in where there's a black female therapist, for example, who understands a lot of her struggles, it changes the dynamic and makes it more possible for someone to open up if they see themselves represented. Absolutely. Is that a similar dynamic to what you're saying? Absolutely. And I mean, and there are data that show that health disparities decrease when there's diverse diversity in the healthcare team. There's a study that came out a couple of years ago looking at infant mortality in the state of Florida. Mm. Now, black infant mortality is two to three times that of white infant mortality in this country. So a black baby born today is two or three times more likely to die than the white baby born in the room next door. Hmm. And there's nothing biological about that. There's no physical, you know, difference or uh, inability to thrive. But there are differences that, that occur over the course of one's life. And so these study, these researchers looked at that uh, infant mortality and looked at when the pediatrician was black and that disparity in infant mortality was reduced by 50%, which doesn't mean, this doesn't mm. mean that non-white or that non-black, sorry, uh, pediatricians didn't wanna take care of those patients. It just means that there are, there are intangibles, whether it is the time that the clinician dedicates or the trust that a patient has in their provider and the extent to which they'll follow along with recommendations and guidance. Mm. There's a lot of factors that go in, but bottom line, there's a difference. It's a yeah. real impact. It is a life and death impact. Yeah, because my next question was going to be like, you know, why that occurs. And it's interesting because on one hand, we want to sort of vilify those doctors if that's happening. So well, why aren't they just giving them the same care that they're giving the white mother? Um, but as you mentioned, there's a lot of sort of like, I don't want to call them elusive, but there's just things you can't see, right? Systemic programming, as you sort of alluded to. Um, but at the same time, it does seem like that is terribly negligent if doctors are supposed to be trained to just care for a person in need, as you indicated was your whole mission when you went, mm -hmm. entered the profession. So where is that balance between completely negligent, almost, yes. <laughs> you know, like almost worthy of being vilified because you're looking mm -hmm. at someone as less than, and this, the, the understanding and maybe the giving them a pass because, well, maybe it's their product of systemic racism and maybe they need help to understand that too. Like, where do we, where's the balance between those two things? Well, I'm going to say there is no pass, right? Like okay. if you are not That's, providing. Okay. Thank you. I want to make sure we're clear no. on that first. <laughs> okay. No, right. we should all provide the best care possible to every patient that we have, regardless of background, demographics, any of the above. And I think that the challenge is that some people don't even know what they're doing. They don't realize mm. that they're providing inadequate care. They don't realize that they are just a, as much a product of the racism in the society as anybody else, clinician or not. And they think that they they may think, and they don't realize that there are some ways in which racism is baked into medical education and training, right? Like it is being undone, but there are, you know, there have historically been assumptions about black people that were just untrue. Mm -hmm. There, one, one example that I'll give is when we look at kidney function, which, you know, we know that kidney disease is very prevalent in black communities. When we look at kidney disease, and the lab test, just the blood test that we do to look at that. There is a test that used to have a correction factor that basically would make it okay, would say that a black person with this kidney function, with this level of kidney damage, actually it's okay because it's normal for black people to mm. have that level as opposed to this white person over here. And what that does is delays the care. It delays uh, more, assessive, more aggressive treatments. And then that black person ends up faring worse because all of this treatment was pushed, pushed down the line. Mm -hmm. And that is being undone system by system. But if, it, if, you look at, if you look at a blood test result, one of the most basic blood tests that we do on, you know, if a person's getting blood work, they're getting this test. And if you look at this and it says, you know, correction factor for African-Americans, if your clinicians are using it, you are going to fare worse. Mm. You are going to do worse. And that is baked into an algorithm. Yeah. So whether a person wants to do well or not, if they're not aware of that and don't 
you know, make the effort, the intentional effort to fix that, they're going to be providing worse care. So, Hmm. and I think people who don't think, who think that they are completely without bias, you know, to my, from my perspective, they are then denying their own humanity. We all have bias. Our job is to acknowledge and overcome it. Hmm. Yeah. You make me also wonder in that regard, because I do, even as a, as a patient of in the past, I've heard certain things like, oh, well, black people have more of X, Y, Z. So, and, and for me, one specific one is when it come, it came to like, um, to vision care, right? Eye care. And, um, when I was a teenager, they said, oh, you have a really large optic nerve and they're looking in behind the eyeball. And, um, and I'm like, should I be worried about that? They're like, well, no, because black people typically have a larger optic eyeball. And I'm like, oh, okay. Well, if that like, like, is that a real thing? Or is that just something that, you know, we're pulling out of the air? And how does that, does that mean that I should not worry about this because a million other black people, like it's such a gray area when you mm-hmm. do those sort of blanket things. So are you saying that, um, is there any validity, validity though, t- to those sorts of assessments where you can rely on them? I mean, is that really a thing or not? So there there are racial and ethnic differences in, in the prevalence of different conditions. Mm-hmm. That's 100% true. The question is why? You know, is it is it access to nutrition, access to physical, safe physical activity? Is it the... Mm many years long impact of redlining in communities? Right. Is it, you know, is it, you know, ancestral, th- ancestral harm? There's a lot that goes on that is part of what, le- what, what ends up with disparate outcomes. And our job is to attack every aspect that we can. Mm-hmm. Um, so yes, there are statistical differences, but the question is why? Why do black? Why am I, as a black woman, more likely to die as a black woman with all those letters after my name? Right. <laughs> um, more likely to die in childbirth than a white woman who's never graduated from college or mm. from from high school, even. Yeah, that's not about my biology. Mm. And it's interesting too about that because it really ties into what we're seeing now, where there are these efforts and successful efforts to not um, tell the whole, not tell the whole story uh, of race and ethnicity and all those cultural applications we could, you know, say that are relevant based on uh, a particular group's existence here in this country. And um, you mentioned redlining, for example, and people don't really understand that and how a lot of uh, Black families were pushed into like industrialized areas or they turned their neighborhoods into industrialized areas where the more desirable areas and communities were built up for the the more desirable people of society, if you will, who were white people. And so there were people exposed to all kinds of, well, uh, what was it like uh, pollution and power plants and this uh, caused maybe potentially high levels of cancerous activity mm-hmm. in the bodies and all those things. So you're right. I mean, if we if we educate society and tell them, the truth about hey, we're not blaming you for your ancestors crazy. Not, you know, we're just <laughs> want you to understand it. Like so, you understand how we got here. And I love that what you're saying when it comes to health is that same dynamic, right? Of just truth in history. It's truth. It's truth, and it's stress. You know, stress is real. It's not like you know, stress is not something that exists only in a person's head. There is a real impact cortisol levels increase. Cortisol is a stress hormone that increases blood pressure that has long-term health effects. So if you live in a community that as a result of redlining is unsafe and your stress level is persistently higher, yes, you are more likely to have high blood pressure. Does that mean that you have high blood pressure because you're a black person or -hmm. because you live in an under-resourced community or are exposed to constant messages and stories of your own your own reflection being harmed where as opposed to stories of you know successes or avenues out of difficult situations yeah um that can lead to less stress and better health Mm, yeah and very similar again i bring up the mental health thing because one thing i learned about on this show which i was so fascinated by and also shocked that i had never heard it i um had an amazing young woman on the show and she talked about and the term just blew my mind, ancestral trauma. Absolutely. And, you know, I mean, here I was like at this stage of my life and I had never even heard of that and never even considered that was a thing. And when she said it, it was like a light, you know, like the heavens opened up and the ancestors were singing at me. 
like I, I totally I mean I was like whoa because we are we are also carrying forth a lot that we can't see as we just mentioned that is from the systemic conditions that we've been subject to and here we are now kind of stuck holding the bill <laughs> if you yes. will you know and it's really tangible those those things hmm powerful stuff that's powerful stuff and I I want to ask you now, when it comes to Faces of Medicine, which is your wonderful documentary that you that you've done, is is it all completed now, or is it just um, the trailer and a few episodes? I know I saw the trailer, which is why I was like, I have to have you on the show. So yes. where are we now with that project? So the, the the project as a whole will be a four part documentary series and a podcast as well, and we have completed the first of those episodes and have had a couple of screenings that have been really well received, including one last night. We got a standing ovation, so I'm happy oh, about that. Wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> um, so that you know what we told in the first episode was the story of four physicians who are practicing right now, and the very first black woman to earn an MD in this country which I didn't know about until a few years ago, happened in 1864. Mm. 1864. The Civil War was not over yet. Right, and she right. was in med school, right? <laughs> like, this is not a story that I think is part of, you know, the larger cultural awareness. And her name was Rebecca Lee Crumpler. Um, and wow. she, right? Wait, 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 wait. I gotta stop right there. Wait, so she's a black woman. Black woman, born to enslaved parents. Right, I mean, because uh-huh. that's like, I mean, that's literally like the year after slavery yeah. ends. Well, yeah. or before, if you lived in Texas in 85, yeah. you know, they kept it exactly. dark a little bit. But I mean, so so at, like a year at, after the Civil War, she's yeah. in medical school. Yes. Wow. I no, she no graduated. Idea. She graduated. She graduated in 1964. Wow. That's amazing. I'd never heard her story at all. So I'm so glad that um, you're talking about that. That's amazing. Yeah. Hmm. So I want to share her story. And uh, we've planned three additional episodes. This is a completely donor funded project because, you know, for better or for worse, these are not stories that if it's not a part of your story, you're compelled to tell, but everybody who's received them has been sort of blown away, which is mm. very rewarding and exciting. And I'm incredibly indebted to the women who share their stories as part of this, because what I really want to do is humanize us as healers, you know, make it more, much more tangible, destroy to some extent the hierarchy that exists when people have those letters, because we're all just people. Mm-hmm. We're all people. Most of us borrowed money to go through school. <laughs> Some of us are still paying it back. Right, yeah. Right? Like it's and we've all had different challenges that we've had to to get through to be in this professional position. And I want to dis I want to sort of dismantle the myth that like, oh, if I've had homelessness, I can I if I've been homeless ever, I can't be a doctor. That's not my story. Yes, mm-hmm. it is this. It is. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if I didn't pass the MCAT, if I didn't get a good score the first time around, then I, there's no way it's over for me. That is absolutely not true. And here's the one, here's the person who's going to show you that it's not. And oh my goodness, what she's doing now. So being able to share all those stories. So we are working, starting to work on the second episode mm-hmm. and we'll work on the last two when it's all, when that one's um, complete. So Yeah, that's amazing. Do you find that you're getting more young people or young um, black women, I I think specifically, are maybe considering medicine where they might not have, or is this inspiring young women, you think, in some way to maybe go into this field, or is that perhaps a hope of the project? That is, uh, so the, I mean, I've got sort of three levels of hope for the project. Well, one is absolutely that. I want people to see themselves reflected, watch this hand come through the window, and just come right in. Just come into this space because it's yours. Mm -hmm. It belongs to them just as much as it does to anybody else. And I've already had a couple of responses from young people who saw it and were like, oh my gosh, I didn't, I didn't think it was possible, but now Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about maybe going down this pathway or I thought about it, but then I thought it wasn't possible, but now I see that I can. So I'm going to dig in and try harder. Yeah. That's amazing. So that's been amazing. Yeah. That's great. Because, you know, that's the whole thing as the cliche, you know, you can't be it if you can't see it. And so many oftentimes for people in marginalized communities, they don't have the same opportunities to see uh, people in certain careers thrive. I always say, for example, financial literacy is one of those things for a lot of urban communities where we didn't have that same level of role models with that financial competency. And then that's tied to systemic situations. And it's just a cycle. So things like what you're doing helps break that cycle for, for future generations. And one thing I remember, and I know I'm not sure if it was you, but I think the, some of the women you were you had in the the trailer that I saw, um, 
I, I may be confused in the trailer with the first episode, but I watched where you had the other doctors, you were speaking to these women. And I think mm-hmm. that a reoccurring theme at one point was how they were mistaken for like not being the doctor by like oh, yeah. the patient. You know, they they assume you're like the receptionist. They're like, so when's the doctor coming in? And you're like, girl, you're looking at her, you know. I've so been here. <laughs> right. So does that so does that happen to you often or is that just not often, but I mean, is that really a thing that you guys have pretty much had to contend with very often in your careers? It's a universal experience. I mean, it's not necessarily every day. It's not necessarily every patient. And in general, I do not assume I assume best intentions, but this is part of what we need. We need to reset what we expect to see when somebody says, you know, the doctor will see you now. Mm-hmm. We need to to mm-hmm. just sort of open up what that could look like because I mean, I have had that happen, white coat stethoscope. I've been in and out of the room and then I heard somebody yelling at the nurse about when they were going to see the doctor. <laughs> like I have I I came in, I saw you, I examined you, I gave you a diagnosis and what are you talking about? Yeah, <laughs> like, she's still waiting for Marcus Welby. Exactly. <laughs> like, no, it's, it's, it, it was me. It has been me this whole time. And so um, I mm. want to show people themselves in these stores. I want to show people who are practicing medicine that we're not alone. Yeah. Uh, because most of us, you know, many of us, I should say, are, you know, one of only one or one of a few at any given hospital system or in any given practice. And so mm-hmm. that can be a, a heavy burden to carry. Yeah. And I want to just humanize us for everybody. I want people to see what the reality is on this side of uh, the curtain. You know, when it comes to that, though, it's so funny. I, I don't even know if, well, I would say it's not a black white thing. And it's not in many ways. I think society has programmed all of us because I'm even guilty of that. You know, here lately, I'm helping to take care of my mother. And over the past couple of years, you know, I've had to deal with a family passing away or, or whatever or getting ill. And so a lot of time spent at Capital Health, <laughs> you know, and um, which I think is a great, you know, place. And they've done some wonderful work and help with my family when we've had some illnesses and stuff. But uh, a recent trip with my mom, you know, this fabulous young black woman comes in and I had been waiting for the doctor. And when she came in, I was like, kind of like not thinking it was her. And, yeah. <laughs> and, and I think I said something kind of really, you know, like when's the doctor coming in and she kind of had to check me on that. And I was like, wow. Yeah. I was celebratory though. Cause I was so excited to see, I mean, she was probably like late twenties, you know, at that mm-hmm. level um, of really being like this, doing a key diagnosis for my mother's condition. And so after the shock of it, in a way, I was like, yeah, girl, like, that's amazing. <laughs> you know what I mean? But yeah, I'm programmed the same way. And that could be, that could be misogyny. That could be sexism. You know, there's so many layers to it mm-hmm. that it's, I'm not sure. A, yeah. I mean, I think that's why we need to just sort of like start putting different images out there that, you know, are not six foot two with you know blue eyes and brown hair <laughs> like, right, right. just put all these yeah. different images out yeah. because we're here we're here and we're here to take care of everybody and we want to take care of everybody and we want it to be as simple as possible because you're not there to sort of wrap your head around you know mm-hmm. around uh who your doctor is going to be you're you're there to get to receive care yeah and so when we can sort of like reset that so that the you can just hear more what the person says as opposed to like putting them in a in a different category of staff and just to be clear that like you already know every category of staff is critically important the nurses Mm -hmm. are critically important the techs are critically important the secretaries oh my goodness if i didn't have good secretaries when i was in the emergency department like it was going to be a bad day Mm -hmm. and so i mean we all every part of the team is necessary and critically important but every part of the team comes in and says what they do. And so we just got to be able to receive that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and now for me, like when I'm sick and I'm not, you know, and I need help, I don't care who comes in that room. <laughs> like, can you make this yeah. pain go away? Like, I don't care if exactly. you're like, right. You could be a hermaphrodite. Like, I don't care what's going on. Like, you know, <laughs> you can have the head of a woman and a man in one body. And I'm like, can you make my pain go away? You know what I mean? Like, exactly. I'm serious. Like, I'm not trying to, um, but no, it's, it's interesting how, you know, we all are programmed and, you know, and like you mentioned the biases that we have, you said that early on and it just, it kind of moves throughout all of our lives. And so we have to sort of check ourselves. So I love that, you yeah. know, and, and sort of, we, we are part of the problem in many ways too. Now you mentioned you were an emergency medicine doctor as well for a while. And, mm-hmm. um, I wonder how does that how does that inspire you and or how did it inspire you with what you saw in that instance and those instances 
to work on behalf of more equity? Because those are like really like life or death on the spot situations. So how did that inform the work that you're doing now with this documentary? So what I loved, one of the things I loved, I loved a lot about emergency medicine was that, you know, it's all comers. It is the, it is an, a newborn to somebody who's 103 years old. It is people who are wealthy. It's people who are under-resourced. It is people who, it is everybody because there's, there's when nobody chooses when they're coming to the emergency department, you don't schedule that visit. Mm -hmm. And so I love that I would just be able to see people from all walks of society that, they would just show up and I'd be able to, to provide in that way. Mm -hmm. And to me, like you mentioned, like that is one of the, one of the truest manifestations of, of providing equitable care. And as I was leaving that space, I wanted to figure out a way to continue that work, to continue to find a way to continue to provide equitable care for patients, whether it was directly through me or through changing the playing field so mm -hmm. that we can have more, more providers that will improve outcomes for everybody. I mean, I still practice medicine right now. I practice in a, in a solo practice doing integrative medicine. So really more looking at the root causes of illnesses and trying to see how we can improve things from that very fundamental level with nutrition and activity and sleep. Oh my goodness, yeah, the importance yeah. of sleep. That's part of why I had to leave because my body was like, you don't get to mess with your, circ your circadian rhythm anymore. Mm. You need to sleep at night, right. every night. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and for a certain I, amount of time and get those hours For a certain amount in. of time. Yeah. I had spent a couple of decades messing with my sleep and it was time to fix that. Yeah. And so, and I had to acknowledge that like I'm human, I'm just as human as anybody else. And that was something that I had to shift. So things had to change. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to be able to continue finding ways to support communities that need the help the most, because mm -hmm. by and large, it doesn't matter what outcome measure you look at, Black folks fare the worst mm -hmm. in this country. Yeah. I mean, the data suggests that, yeah, this is not conjecture. Like We can back that up with actual yeah, data and information. When it comes to the ER, though, I am wondering about something. And I I never, I didn't really research if it's a myth or not, but my partner always tells me like whenever I go out or whenever I'm, whatever I'm doing, like if we go on vacation, especially, but I can't leave the room without him going, make sure you have your insurance card, make sure you have your insurance card. <laughs> um, and I was like, what is wrong with you? He goes, no, because like if something happens, you know, and you have to go to the ER, you'll get better. They'll, they'll respond better if they think you have insurance. And I thought, is that a myth or is that really a thing? Like, it's because when we're talking about equity in ER care, like, mm -hmm. you know, is that a thing where like, you know, you could potentially not receive the- No. Is that, okay. So yes, I want to know if that like a, a myth or not. That, that, if it, if that exists in a place, then that's a place that needs to be reported. Yeah. Our job in the emergency department is to see anybody who shows up to provide the same level of care to anybody. Now we know that there are going to be differences in people's ability to pay. I never knew the insurance status of a single patient I saw. Mm -hmm. I didn't look at it. It was not right. part of my flow. My flow was what is your name? How old are you? What's what's hurting you? Why are you here? Right. You don't look at the insurance information. It's not part of the process for the for the uh, for the clinicians, for the physicians and providers. Um, you know, the secretaries need to get that information. But they can also fill it in later. It does not necessarily have to be there from the from from the jump. Like you can, because again, people don't schedule their emergencies, so you can right. show up yeah, yeah. in whatever state you are in, and you can provide that a couple of days later once the dust has settled. But all hospitals have ways to sort of catch things up at the very end, because a lot of folks don't have that information on hold, especially if a person is unconscious. They can't really tell you, you know, mm, yeah, what yeah. their place of employment is. Right. Yeah. That's <laughs> so true. We're not gonna yeah. Get I that. didn't think about that. Yeah. I mean, and I don't think it's ever really for for the, the, the thank God I haven't been to the ER a lot in my life. But the times I've gone, like it wasn't like that was a priority really uh, when I got checked in. But I mean, it you are asked obviously if you are conscious. You are asked. <laughs> so, but you there, know. it's a it's a federal law. Like mm -hmm. it is a federal law based on poor outcomes that happened years ago when hospitals did say, no, you don't have insurance. Like but when, when a woman died in a childbirth situation uh, because she didn't have the insurance that a hospital accepted. So federal legislation was passed many years ago to, uh, to mandate that a screening exam at the very least 
but full care, if indicated, was provided to anybody who showed up in any emergency department in this country. Hmm. Yeah, that's really, that's how it should be. And of course, you do hear often, though, although you're not in the insurance side of things, comparatively to other countries, apparently, we do spend a lot more here. <gasps> Uh, when we have that a, is an understatement. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, I just I read an article about a family who, you know, a woman was here and she gave birth here just sort of, you know, I would say accidentally. <laughs> she had, she, you know, she kind of gave birth a little earlier than anticipated. So she was here from the UK when she gave birth. And like, you know, she got like a bill for like $100,000. She's like, did I give birth to like a gold bullion? Like what happened? Yeah. And she can't understand it. She's like, well, in the UK, a normal birth with any with, without complications is $3,000. So let's say. Mm -hmm. So I think when you look at disparities like that um, or inconsistencies like that, if you will, and different things that go into different countries, um, do you think that that gives people less faith in the system, especially marginalized people, where we're afraid, people who are of color are like, I'm dying, I'm sick, I know something's wrong, but I could lose my house if I go call the exactly. if I go to the ER. That's like real. they're right, they're making a choice. So speaking a little bit to that, like how do we address in your opinion, I know you're not gonna have the answer, but what do you what are some ways to address that to instill more faith in healthcare when that's one of the dynamics? Yeah. Our system is so broken. It really is. I mean, we spend nearly twice as much as the next closest developed country per capita on healthcare. Our life expectancy, our maternal mortality, our infant mortality, all of our data, our diabetes, everything is worse than everybody else. I mean, like our our maternal mortality rate, I think is like 54th in the world, mm. right? Mm. We are not doing well. We, If this is supposed to be about getting value for your money, we are not getting it. Mm. And when we look at people who delay care, if you don't, you know, especially if we're looking at disparities in health outcomes, you know, people of color are more likely to have jobs that don't come with insurance or come with marginal insurance. Right. And so even if somebody comes to the emergency department and they get the care they need, they may have delayed that care for exactly what you were talking about because they didn't know how they were going to pay the bill afterwards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I personally think we need a safety net. We need a system that does not, uh, where insurance and coverage for real life events that people cannot plan and do not, you know, they're not, it's not somebody's fault that right, they right. developed colon cancer, right? Mm. Why should that bankrupt a person? Why should receiving yeah. care for a health condition bankrupt a person? It is, it boggles my mind that we have a system that's like that. So I think a single bear solution is essential. Mm -hmm. I think having people know that they can receive care without it being tethered to an employer is absolutely essential and that life-saving medications that people need don't bankrupt them yeah you know, medicate but the, the the money that people spend just to survive and when folks ha don't have a lot of resources deciding whether to pay for that prescription versus eating getting or, your groceries or right. gas to get to your job and then you come around to your physician and they say that you're non-compliant with the treatment plan but how can you be non-compliant when your 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 choices your choices are very immediate sometimes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's really that is sad. Um, and I tell people people who are patriotic about this country often, I just say, listen, be patriotic. But what will really be helpful is if we are truthful about the things that are wrong. You mentioned, you know, these are things in medicine, but I also mention sometimes in technology and transportation and. You know, I laugh at like, you know, the fact that we have our high speed train here, like J Japan has a train that goes 300 miles per hour, like it's never had an accident. Yeah. You know, our trains here hit 125, they fly off the track, Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know, and so there's a point where we have to say, hey, I, I love the slogan, greatest country on earth, but unless we're really doing that and delivering that, we need to retire that slogan until we catch up to the hype 100%. of it. Yeah. hundred percent. There's way too much. I mean- Go capitalism. I'm down in some areas. Healthcare is not an area for capitalism. Mm. It does not make sense. Yeah. I hope that everyone out there listening and who's going to watch uh, this podcast as well will be inspired as I have been. And I also want to give full disclosure that um, 
the way I found out about you, of course, is because we're somewhat family now too, you and I, yeah. because it was your cousin who was married to my cousin. And they told me about you. They're like, you know, you should check out my cousin. She's a doctor doing this amazing thing. And, you know, everybody always pitches people for podcasts. You're like, you're like okay, <laughs> whatever. And then, and then I saw the wonderful work you're doing. And it really is remarkable. And um, I just want to say congratulations and thank you for all you're doing. So we appreciate you being here today on Motivational Mondays. Thank you for having me. It has been an absolute pleasure. And if anybody wants to find out more, they can go to facesofmedicine.org. Thank you.